My name is Marcus Fernley. I'm working for WSP. WSP has uh, 50 years of experience in floating concrete structures. And I'll be talking about design and certification of concrete substructures for wind turbines. And uh, I'll be focusing on mostly on offshore, though the, the, uh, the land-based uh, the process is very similar, but right now I think all our area arealine is uh, working towards offshore because, as Jason mentioned, mentioned there are a lot of new opportunities coming up. Quick outline: what I'm going to be talking about. First, I'm going to talk about the responsibilities of the different uh, parties involved in design and construction of this type of uh, plants. And I'll be quickly touching the design criteria, which you some of them heard already from uh, Thor Ole. Then I'll be uh, quickly reviewing the typical loads and the load cases and go into some of the analytical approaches. And I'll be talking about the typical concrete design drivers and ultimately the applicable codes that are available now. So in terms of the, the responsibilities, you see the first, first one on the left is that the utility. So these are the end users and uh, they are driving uh, everything, but of course, they're not necessarily the owners. They have a typically they have a power purchase agreement with a developer, and the developer may or may not be the owner of the entire uh, construction, certainly, but then also uh, the the wind farm itself. And the developer has his own group of uh, owners, engineers, and the certification entity like DNV or ABS are directly working with the developer for the developer. And then, of course, they have also their underwriter and insurance and financial institution they have to report to and make the case that everything is uh, secure and financeable. And they then go into a, an agreement with uh, EPCI, Engineering Procurement Construction and the Installation Contractor. This model is not quite in... in uh, process right now because we, we're still uh, experimenting with uh, how that works. So right now, a developer is probably more likely to, to still skip the EPCI and is uh, contracting directly the, the entities that typically the EPCI would lead. But that will be, uh, in the future, it will probably all run through EPCI. But what is typical for the of oil and gas industry is there's, there's not really uh, much new in terms of this type of it responsibilities for energy companies. So EPCI, he has a technology supplier, and you saw that with uh, Toreole, that uh, somebody has to come up with the system and how it works and has the hydrodynamic analysis. And that is where all this uh, conceptual design comes in and testing so that we have a system that works, right? And then the foundation engineer is the one who takes that system. It might be the technology supplier themselves, or it might be a separate entity that uh, makes everything to fit codes and uh, actually um, insurable, right? And then we have a construction contractor, which uh, hopefully in close collaboration with the engineers works on how to construct it and then actually builds it. And we have an installation contractor, which for offshore is, of course, a marine contractor who deploys the structure and uh, uh, installs everything. And then the turbine supplier is uh, also another entity, and they bring in the big turbines, and they have, a, they have very much an involvement in the design itself because they know exactly what uh, controls the design because the turbine uh, has a lot of control of the responses to the environment. And then you have other suppliers in uh, offshore wind that will be like uh, uh, mooring systems for floating offshore wind or, or uh, uh, anchorage systems for fixed bottom. But one thing by concrete, right? One thing you, you notice is uh, whether, whether this is a fixed structure or not, it's going to be, has, it has to float at some point. We have to float it into page, place. Yeah. Tor has been going there into that quite nicely because otherwise uh, we cannot build it where it's going to be installed. So the typical design criteria, just a generalist here, is on the structural side, of course, the typical strength service. Fatigue is a, is a big one in, in wind, and I'll get into that later on. And of course, durability, this is uh, very important for the offshore uh, environment. And that is where uh, concrete 
uh, excels very well, actually in fatigue as well and strength. Then operation and maintenance. Uh, this this uh, Structures have to be designed to have access to it. You have to be able to, to monitor it and, and make changes. And then on the construction side, industrialization, industrialized fabrication is one of the key uh, challenges to how do you build uh, typically or prospectively 50 turbines or hulls within a certain construction period. And the industry is right now looking at uh, a turbine a week, maybe a turbine per every week that has to be constructed and pulled out. And as those turbines get bigger, the more challenging that becomes. Then the turbine integration, and we have to put the turbine on the substructure eventually, so that can happen for floating or fixed, both of them, either at the key site before it gets uh, deployed, or it can be happening out in the ocean once it's installed. Then we also have to think about deployment. How do we uh, put it out and how do we decommission it at the end? Let's see. Typically on the typical loads that we have is of course all the environmental loads. This wind is the big one and I'll get into that a little bit more details later. Waves, then the water level has a, an influence, Cold currents of course, marine growth, these are the typical design criteria for or any offshore structures. And then uh, uh, sea ice, ice, seismic loads and extreme temperature. That de depends, of course, very much on the site where we're at. We also have to design for accidental load, which is uh, both impact and flooded condition for the floating structures, for the floating turbines. The operational condition, they're, they're very special for any wind uh, turbine, land or uh, offshore. And it has to do with uh, that the, the turbine has a control and really controls the response to any sorts of uh, environmental conditions. So a turbine, first, it has to start up. So from zero rotation to full production rota rotation. And then it is the power production rotation. Then you have a normal shutdown where you slowly shut down that you don't get too many uh, dynamic hits. And then you have an emergency stop where you may have to stop very quickly. This is a different response. And ultimately, you have a park condition for, let's say, high winds that you just sail through the winds or that you have a failure or a faulty condition that you have to shut down and park your, your uh, turbine. And on the environmental side, you have the normal winds, the turbulent winds, the extreme operational gusts. And these are the typical environments while the turbine is running, then you have uh, extreme wind turbulence and extreme wind shear, shear. You have to take into consideration that may or may not be already when you shut down your, uh, your turbine to uh, ride out a storm, let's say. And then on, of course, on, on, the, on the sea and on the water, you have the normal and extreme currents, you have normal sea states, you have severe sea states. With severe sea states, that's really designed a decision whether you say my turbine is going to run through a severe sear stage or it's going to stop and park. Usually, of course, with severe sear stage, you also have severe winds and you're probably going to be parking. Then you have normal water levels, you have extreme water levels, and that changes the entire wave environment or, or wave response on your structure. And you have a uh, wind wave misalignments. Then you have extreme directional changes that uh, your turbine might not be fast enough to turn in, uh, sync, in sync with your wind. Then these were all the basically normal design conditions. And here we have the malfunctional conditions, like a malfunction of a control system that one of your blade may not turn anymore or your, your uh, rotor may not uh, be able to yaw anymore and has a different angle of wind attack, which is not really designed to the abnormal condition. And then you have all those... <laughs> conditions, the transitions, transitional, transitional conditions in between. So you can, in offshore winds, you can easily have a, a 10,000 or more, well, multiple of tens of thousands of low cases that you have to consider to come up with your load. Uh, 
that's on the operational side. And then on the temporary conditions I talked about, uh, the big ones, of course, is the construction and deployment itself. And with uh, industrialized constru construction, you probably talk about modularization. And uh, you here you see a sample of actually the, the RCOM of three uh, tripod structure that you would have three construction uh, stations where you produce parts of it and then you assemble everything and then you have to launch the structure. So that's another uh, low case. And then you bring that, let's say, at the outfitting pier, so shown on the left bottom, and you have to install the turbine before you float it out. And you may have to design for wet storage. You may have it float during wet storage. You may sink it to the to a seafloor in a bay for wet storage, and then the turbine integration. So uh, there's a lot of cost that can be saved by a good design for those temporary cons uh, conditions, in particular the industrialized construction. That's that's basically a, one of the big focuses these days. Then an important one, the temporary construction condition is deployment to tow it out into sea. What kind of a sea state do you want to accept? And uh, are you going to tow with a turbine installed already, which is for a floating structure, of course, the case, but it could also be for a fixed structure that you have the turbine already installed. And then the submersion of the structure, which Ole already uh, touched, is when you have to go through the critical uh, change of stiffness as you break through the water plane and get the structure all the way down. And you do that with ballasting. On the analysis approach, you have to uh, look at time history series so that you can uh, bring in the wind response, the turbine uh, controller, and the wave climate itself. <clears throat> so typically, you start with coming up with the geometry. <clears throat> And mind you, probably this geometry is already uh, fixed pretty much from uh, from conceptual design. That can be maybe just a simple software like Rhino. Then you uh, develop the wave interaction of this uh, form and shape of this structure. And that may be a software like uh, Wamit. And then you do the time series with uh, the wind time series developed that flow into this analysis and then the turbine response control. And this, this is really the uh, comes from the turbine manufacturer themselves. He so said, what, what is your turbine going to do if the wind is a certain way, a certain strength, a certain direction, or a certain change, certain wind shear? And uh, that has to be uh, basically modeled and simulated in the time, in time series analysis. And once you get that done, and that can be, there are several softwares that are already uh, can do this type of analysis. Then you, you get the loads, and with that, you use that in a non linear structural analysis to, to come up with the concrete design. And then you may have to add the seismic analysis, the fatigue the, the damage analysis, and res resonance check that can be with the same software, can be with additional software, or just hand calculations. Typical concrete design drivers is it's all about cracking. We know that it's in marine construction on the service, but also under fatigue. And uh, what's new for certainly uh, for the not new for the floating structures is the water tightness, and that is of course done with, uh, with providing a compression zone. So a lot of or most of those structures there post tension to to at least. Uh, provide partial or a full compression zone. Then the fatigue is, is a big one. And uh, if you can avoid cracking, concrete does very well in fatigue on the compression, not very well in, in concrete. So on the, the left little bottom gra graph, you see the fatigue uh, SN curve for concrete for different uh, minimum concrete strength, uh, minimum concrete uh, compression levels. And as you can see it, it depends actually on what is the, the concrete stress level that is your fatigue range. And uh, our typical uh, number of cycles is in the power eight range and uh, tensile. This is would be with tension. This graph, the dotted line is uh, so sort of cracking is basically expected when we have tension in concrete on the fatigue cycles. On, on the steel side, <clears throat> 
you can see our uh, Trout 8 is uh, very low. So we have very low stress levels that we have allowable in fatigue under high cycles. Uh, but uh, typically, uh, these, these are then the high cycles that come from the turbines, so you can control that. Quickly to the applicable codes, we, everything is driven by the International Electrical Commission, Committee Code 61400, which, dis, uh, which uh, defines all the wind turbine requirements and uh, low cases. Of the, mostly of the control and, and uh, the wind itself. And then we have uh, an ASCE, uh, a AWEA document that gives some basic recommendations. But really, the whole core design is uh, now defined by ABS, by, by basic certification organizations. So ABS has a guideline, and this is a rather new one from 2020 from last year on guide for building and class and floating offshore and they also have fixed offshore wind turbine guideline and then of course the DNVGL has a guideline on loads and on offshore structures and that the offshore structure code comes pretty much out of the, the oil and gas industry and once you have uh, the you, you mostly have the fatigue criteria and general uh, uh, low criteria and design criteria is defined. And then for the, the detailed concrete design, you will go straight into, uh, here in the US, into ACI 318. You follow this code. And in terms of uh, European codes, if you uh, have in design in Europe. So this was my quick details on design criteria. And I have my contact up here. Thanks, Dan. Thank you ever so much, Marcus. Um, that was terrific.